Right, so, who has any questions? Okay. Um, with the violent situation, and it being in human nature, and what you say about the environment is very tough. Um, just go back to what I've learned. I um, wanted to know what they do about psychopaths. Psychopaths, um, well, they're, they're some of the people who are, you know, the most damaged by society. I mean, you know, they, these are the people who have encountered some of the worst situations and the most neglect. You know, there's, um, there's, no, there's no amount of, you know, underestimating, um, you know, the kind of suffering that these people have encountered. And, and that is... that that falls upon the cause of why they've developed in that manner. So not only, because we, we need to approach this problem with, with two prongs, essentially. We, we need to make sure that we don't allow any child to be, you know, we, well, we try and do our best to make sure that every child is looked after, fed, loved, and provided for. I'm uh, talking in terms of biological basis of not being emotionally connected. Uh, mm. Sort of extreme autism, where you know, if you talk to a psychopath, they'd be, mm. so, yeah, I'm very the corner, and yeah, yeah. They're just from the corner, and talking to you as if they've, they've just done their shopping. It's no mm. emotional connection, and I don't yeah. think that you'd be able to change that. So, yeah, so well, basically, what would you do mm. if you had situations where you had to protect? everybody else from one person's behaviour without resorting back to prisons. Yeah, well that's, well I mean that's that's why I say that we need to basically take take this two-pronged approach. One, actually take the preventative um, case so that, you know, we we oh, actually no, do what we can to stop any. future cases from developing. Um, but there's also the other pronged approach where we, where it's a very tentative um, issue of how we deal with the psychopaths that actually do currently exist, and and I I believe that you know we need to get to the bottom of what has caused that problem, and ultimately, you know, as as uh, you know, contentious as this might sound to a lot of people, we need to provide them what they were never given, love. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with what you're saying other circumstances of crime. Mm. But in terms of like uh, apprehension, uh, if, the, if they pose a, um, if they pose like a threat to society, well, well obviously in, in those kind of cases they need to, they need to be apprehended because, you know, as in a, you know, in a, in a non-violent way as possible. Right, okay. So you do agree with some kind of control, but in a different, a completely different way. In in a sen in a sense of a transition, because uh, I mean the we've noticed that uh, that it's the that it's the the, uh, the negativities of our society and the stresses upon our society and the and the the psychological distortions that come out of that that breeds even more um, more despotic um, behaviours and it just snowballs further and further and that's why we've got. To this point, so when we stop, when we actually, you know, try to, you know, in a, in a sense, run alongside that snowball and like try to chip away at it as much as we can to sort of reduce it down, and then that will that will stop, you know, further ones being being developed. But it's, you know, it's a, it's a bit like um, it's a bit like some uh, I can't think of any uh, particular. Analogy, but it's it's something where you where you stop the uh, stop any more from from occurring, but you also try and as compassionately as possible deal with the problems that you already have in society. And you know one of one of the means is that I mean, like say for example, um, there's have you uh, there's a deleted scene from uh, from the film Sicko uh, by Michael Moore, it's a documentary that he made. Um, and it's it's on the it's on the extras of the DVD under the title "Is Norway a Utopia?" And basically, through the, through the film Sicko, if any of you have seen it, he basically examines the healthcare systems uh, of loads of different countries. And in fact, there's one 
comedic bit. He basically spends 20 minutes of the documentary going all the way around an NHS hospital asking people, where do we pay? Where do we pay? You know, but, uh, but he goes to Norway and finds out what their prison system is like. And it could be closely resembled to possibly a holiday camp from from the outset. I think I've seen it on YouTube. Yeah. What a resource-based economy would look like. That's the one. Yeah, That's the one. It's and just like a little island, isn't it? Like, yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah, and uh, and these these people, they're you know one one of them. Were, I think he was a uh, uh, he killed someone with yeah. an axe or something or a chainsaw yeah. or something, and uh, and he. You know, he's being properly rehabilitated because he's actually not being punished. Because that, because pun- as we've discussed, punishment is just another form of violence. Another, f- and it's essentially revenge. It won't, it won't get any better. Well, I'm, so. I'm not against. I mean, I am against the death penalty, and I don't believe anybody's evil as such. Mm. I was just thinking that if you couldn't change it because it's biological, that you'd still need the protection. What do you um, think about, um, I think it's Sweden or Norway, with, um, where the paedophiles actually agree to be castrated because they want that desire to stop and then they're free to live their life? Uh, um, if, it's the, if it's the choice of the individual and if it's truly a non-coerced decision, then you know anyone, anyone can make that decision. I mean, it's, it's a bit like anyone... Like any any one of us just decides to get a um, to get a hysterectomy or, or whatever, we, we make a personal choice. A, a paedophile could make that that Again, choice as well. The number of paedophiles that were exist in a resource based economy would be significantly lower than what we have today. Because very significantly lower. Um, so I, I suppose that's on your beliefs, but I pro- I was I'm coming from the standpoint of it being um, like a biological thing more. You know, like. I would say that being homosexual is, which I would, as evidence for that, I would probably say, um, if you tested, probably for a male that's homosexual, not always the case, but on some cases maybe has more female hormones with a higher voice than the mannerism. So I would, I would say that being having a sexual orientation, which is, I would say has got some biological, but I don't know yet. Is that based on scientific research or? Uh, well, so somebody, yeah, like it's it's so hard to yeah. It's more based on experiences of an individual as a child sexual abuse. Mixture, I'm, I'm not an expert, obviously. Yeah, it it so can. Right, it, would reduce, it can be. Maybe not ex- it can be a bit of a mixture. I mean, uh, I I mean, I've thought um, a lot about you know what. Um, you know what? Uh, you know what is the deciding factor between someone being heterosexual and homosexual? You know, is it? You know, it's, it, it can't be entirely the environment. And it can't be entirely the genetics or, or biology. And it's, it, that, I mean, that in of itself is a very difficult one uh, to answer. But um, would you say there's media influences towards homosexuality? So, sorry. Would you say there's media influences towards homosexuality? Has there been some influence into it? Um, well, they, I mean, you know, since since we are, since as human beings we are, you know, uh, susceptible to our environment, and you know, when we uh, when we engage our environment, we we are affected by it, and thus we also affect it as well. It's a symbiotic relationship, so it, it it's hard to tell where the, you know, the, I mean. There probably isn't any line between us and the us and the environment because it's a constantly interacting thing. So it's very difficult. So I mean, I, in the mainstream media, there is like an influence in, in a yeah, way, in a way. Like, there can be, yeah. yeah. There can so be. So in the mainstream media, there's a big influence on the way mm. we live. Yeah. Yeah. So would you say in the mainstream media they have influenced homosexuality to a great level? I just think it's more out there now because it's more accepted. But, but are you saying there's no influence at all? Well, well they, it, it would it would be premature to to, disre- to disregard I'm not, I'm any. I'm not homophobic, influence. anything like that. But mm. what I'm saying is, yeah. you will get homosexuals, but has it been mm. exaggerated through media? Okay, right. That would be very diff- well, That would be very hard to tell. Yeah, we we got we got tons of media now. Maybe live a lie and have kids and everything else and deny his... Well, it's against the law, I think, to be homosexual and to 
Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Our yeah. Our yeah. Lifetimes, people have been, you know, come. Yeah, You've got a lot of homosexuals are actually really quite nasty. media friendly. They're mm. very outgoing, or they mm. appear that way. So it's a natural thing for them to to yeah. get out in a way yeah. to entertain people. So yeah, I and, think the um, two go hand in hand. It's not. Yeah, and and I su- and I suppose you know it, whether it whether it's you know someone being heterosexual or homosexual, as long as they're not harming anyone, what's the big deal? Who cares? Yes. Well, religion cares. <laughs> Mm, but, but then again, that's that's because religion itself steps, um, you know, steps over the line and basically saying, you know, my beliefs entitle me to impose upon your freedom, and that's that's where the line gets drawn. You know, I mean, you know, in, in a resource-based economy, you know, there there will be complete freedom of religion. There just won't be the freedom to impose on other people's freedoms. So. You know, um, that's what I was going to say to you because I mean, I believe in God, but I don't believe in religion as an institution. So, mm. I was going to say, what were the because of the scientific element? So, you just basically say you can have whatever belief you want, yeah, yeah. I mean, so um, yeah, yeah and because and, it's a bit like, um, it's a bit like one of the things uh, Bill Hicks said that uh, you know. Um, the final point about drugs, about alcohol, about pornography, whatever that is, what business is it, uh, what business is it of yours, whatever I do, read, buy, see, or take into my body, as long as I don't harm another human being on this planet? The thing is, though, we need to be careful with, with that saying of as long as I don't impose, because what can happen is a group of like-minded people, um, I'll take an example of, I mean, I'm Jewish, I'm not religious, but I was born Jewish, and if you go into uh, Stanford in North London, um, you could find a big community of Orthodox Jews that don't impose their religion on anybody, but in their community they demand that everything in that area, you know, if it's from the buttons that you press on the, on the sidewalks, if you know, everything is now automated on, on, the, sh- on the Saturday, because they all announce to whatever reasons to make. So they do impose it within their community, so what happens is that community is, you know, becoming larger and larger, so where, where do we... You know, where, where do we put the line so you know you can so it, it has to stay on an individual level rather than to affect yeah. any physical environment around and, you um, yeah. and I'd say the, the solution to that because you know because obviously you know the people will always disagree on, on different things people you know we, we have new, unique personalities different perspectives you know we will want different things so therefore what's the, the solution for that is to allow freedom of movement. If you don't, if you don't want to live in, say, a resource-based economy, then don't live in a resource-based economy. You know, um, you know, you'll be you'll be free to free to go somewhere somewhere you want. If you know, if you want to, you know, build um, build your own community, we can help provide and um, provide you with whatever you need to build that build that community. So you don't have to toil to do it yourself. If you want to build it yourself. There you go. Well, we can provide resources for you. If you don't want the resources, but well, you can go them yourself. You know. Do you think people are naturally territorial? Um, I wouldn't say so. No, because I mean, what was the question? It's. Uh, do you um, think people are naturally territorial? Well, it's. I mean, it's understandable given the fact that for all of our existence, we've lived within scarcity. We. Until this point, this is the only point in time where we have finally been able to create an abundance of what we would um, need and also what we would want as well. It's the only point in time where that sort of thing has been possible. Every other point in time, we've had to fight for what we can get. It's the same reason why we have social stratification in a pride of lions, for example, because there's not enough to go around. You know, that they have, you know, and in, in those in those stratified um, environments, if you weren't aggressive and territorial and you know that sort of thing, you didn't survive. So therefore, you had to. Uh, so I can I can understand to a certain extent it would be human nature to be territorial only within a scarcity based environment. However, not ubiquitously. You know, it's, it's quite um, distinctive though to be. To be territorial, even even when you have abundance of what you need, you know you can mm. be the wealthiest person in the planet 
and you would still have gates surrounding everything that you own, even though, mm. even though probably most of your wealth is probably in a bank, you know, which is protected by someone else. Mm. You'd still have everything you what, have. What's that wealthy person protecting? The wealth. It's wealth, money, assets. But you are that, that's what makes him. But, but you are in abundance. Rest. You can be in abundance of wealth, not only in the, in the property that you have, but you could have an abundance but of wealth when you everywhere got, when else. When you got everything you need, there's no need for aggression. Well, the they got, they got well, thing is, the the, aggre the aggression comes in because of the of the condition of scarcity. Like, like for example, my dog. She, uh, when when we feed her, we we just um, we just put the put the food in her bowl and we leave her alone because, you know, she's a rescue dog and she was really really badly treated before, and you know she growls at us like quite regularly anyway. But uh, but in that in that in that scenario. Our dog has what she what she needs right then and there, but the reason why she growls is because she wants to protect what she has. She recognises that that that's what you know. She she may have what she needs, but she doesn't have free access to what she needs whenever she wants. She don't, she really only gets fed when we feed her. You know, she's not like a cat that can like go out and kill a mouse and say drop its head in front of you and go, look what I did, you know. <laughs> Do you think that if, if we were to move to a resource-based economy, that people's natural natural instinct would be to, to, to be greedy in case that is taken away? So say, you would, say it was a resource-based economy and there were shops mm. like there are now, supermarkets, and people could go into that supermarket and only take what they need, the fact that they can take whatever they want, probably the case, would mean that their natural instinct would probably be to take more than what they need in case it was to be then taken away because you never know what the mm. future holds. You don't know if there's going to be a famine or, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. So yeah. the tendency naturally would be to take more than what you need. Yeah, that's that, like a, you know, a squirrel. Yeah. That can they, be... They worked it out on the model that you were, was on the video that, I don't know, your family needed two chickens a week and whatever else and so much like potatoes. Mm. Each person will just get that. I would say, wouldn't it work like that? Well, the, basically, the, um, the the aqua, the aquaponic uh, systems that Douglas Millet is uh, is designing are basically fully automated, off-grid aquaponic farming facilities. That that you know, basically, they um, they collect their own water as well. You can basically just drop them, drop them, but we're not physically drop them down, but, you know, install them virtually anywhere and they'll crank out, you know, healthy, um, healthy um, food, and vegetable, food and vegetables for about 50 years. And the thing is... No, I was just going to say, don't you think that um, the fear is really going to be exacerbated during a transitional period once we've got there, it's okay, you know, we'll, mm. we'll all be able to cope with it, but... It's that transitional period where we gradually let it go of the fear of yeah. the old way of living and getting used to the new way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, that that is that is going to be the the very difficult uh, point. Like, like um, any you know any of you that are parents in this room will know that you know when you when you try and uh, wean your child off of like one activity or like a favourite toy or you know try and take the training wheels off their their bike or something, there is that difficult transition period. From having that having that security to, well, I'm I'm being self sufficient. I'm riding on my own without any training wheels. You know, you know, you a kid can't snap to that to that sort of thing. They have to gradually be eased into it. So yeah, I do agree that the transition is going to you know as as. Amanda made a great point about <laughs> can we not um, as models to show the rest of the world, like set up small communities where everything is shared. There are, there is one in Brazil. They are here now. 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 They are here
we parked off that route just where we share. It's dependent on your needs. If you need a small house, that's what you need. So you're an electrician, you go and fix it within your. Yeah. And um, and that and that that kind of thing that's uh, that that falls perfectly in line with the uh, the free economy community because that's basically a skill trade um, I idea. Is or removing the need for us to, like you said, take stuff because of the fear that it will run out yeah. or, you know, we just won't have access. First of all, I think, um, I know it might sound scary because of the way we think it will be abused today, but it might get to a point where every human being has a chip that would measure the, um, the physical needs as, as far as nutrition and everything else on a very healthy level of what we need and that would send in order to the system to provide you that specific food. Um, I know now we fear that having chips in us yeah, because obviously the government I think, will. I think that like, having, That's yeah, one having, having what you need though would literally be taking away the freedom to choose what you No, no, you, you can still. What, what I was going to say is in addition to that, you will still have an ordering system if you like in any home or in any way, or it, could, it could be even an internet based thing that you can literally go and order what you would like. But then again, everybody needs to take consideration the carry, carrying capacity of the environment that you live in and not suddenly demand, um, you know, loads of pineapples when I live in a country that doesn't actually grow that. So that means, I'm gonna, you know, so yeah. everybody would, would live in an environment, you know, they, they understand that, you know, there, there's a big impact on their wants you know, compared to what, you know, what they need. So if they need something, that's great. If you want something, that's okay. But just bear in mind that there is a consequence to that. So I think we'll be more compassionate to everything else, to the environment, to the people. So. Yeah. But, uh, I think there's technological solutions. Plus, you're living in a world with no fear. So, when there's no fear, yeah. why, 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 why fear? I mean, um, to. You had your own shop, right? Say you ran your own shop and you were feeding your children, but you had to. I know it's gone away from that. And you had to, like, sell the stuff that was left in your shop. Then you wouldn't suddenly try to take, like, everything and have a massive feast where you could or store it all in case you ran out. You would just leave it and just take some. Like yeah, it's sharing, it's, it's like kind of not it's kind of like well, that um, not that drastic, but to take all of it. it's it's kind of like anything when uh, when you're actually having to go somewhere and get something, you like say for example uh, that, that was like one of the examples when I was um, uh, helping my dad out and I was uh, moving bricks from one place to another using a wheelbarrow. Um, I didn't just load up the wheelbarrow as big as it could. Um, as many as it could carry, and then think I could do that. I I put in just enough that you know that would make the the overall uh, transportation of the bricks from there to there as efficient as possible, as well as not um, overloading the wheelbarrow and wearing myself self out more. So there's that there's that compromise between the efficiency and the um, and the sustainability of the products. So. Um, in terms of the example that you gave, that you know people might just you know just go in and start grabbing loads of uh, loads of stuff. Well, why why would they do that when that food will go bad eventually? It would just be wasteful. And 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 it, and in the in the example of uh, they may fear some kind of famine or something. That is why one of the main uh, one of the main attributes that is implemented into any of, of the systems that is that is used in a resource-based economy is redundancy. Like uh, like Douglas Millett talks about redundancy quite a lot. That you know because he used to work in the space space shuttle program. That uh, basically with the with the space shuttle it doesn't have one onboard computer. It has three because there's redundant uh, redundancies. It's, it's the same reason why we have two lungs. 
systems, redundancy. You know, if one if one fails, we got yeah, we've got backup systems. So the so when you have redundant multiple levels of redundancy put in, then it covers that those those sorts of things. And even in the unlikely case that multiple um, multiple levels of redundancies fail, then that is also why people are not just taught um, people. That's why people aren't you know taught to be apathetic about growing food themselves manually. People are people are encouraged to learn that as well, just in case. Like say for example, you know today when we're, we're not taught to do all our in. School kids aren't taught to just leave your calculations to a calculator. They're taught um, basic mathematics because that's a, that's a useful skill. It has multiple applications. And, and it's also a fail-safe for if you don't have a calculator or if your calculator breaks. Then you at least know that you can do that mathematics in your head, obviously not extreme mathematics that you know is best delegated to a calculator. But, you know, it's... You know, I can understand that why it's uh, that sort of you know um, grab as much as you can just in case. That's a that's a, a habit that is bred into us from so long ago because we because we've always lived lived within that scarcity where we've always been you know like like say for example doomsday preppers as as they're called they they advocate and I, and I completely agree that um, that you know whenever you go shopping. Maybe buy an extra bag of rice, or something, or an, or an extra bag of pasta, or something. You know, just in case for. But then again, that is because of the recognition that the current system is going to collapse by its own found fundamental logic anyway. So the preparation for that has an actual factual basis. However, in a resource-based economy, we have uh, the ability to create systems with multiple levels of redundancy that will um, that will negate the need for for any of those things. It's just getting through that transition period, both in values and in the knowledge of the technology itself. Do you think that um, in a resource-based economy, that um, there will be there will have to be more collaboration because not everybody's going to run all the own food so people will be more inclined to do what they feel passionate about. So if you have somebody who loves gardening, then they'll mm. be happier to do all of the gardening for a group of people. And then we'll let them do the gardening. Exactly. If they want to so do it, go yes. right ahead. Precisely. So and will most food, food production be through machinery? Um, yeah. I'd say I'd say most of it most, most of it will because you know it's. I mean, ideally, to make food, it'd be done by machines. Yeah, I mean, it's I mean, it's the it's the far more productive way of doing it. If if people really truly want to uh, want to grow the grow the food themselves, go have at it. You know, we we have the technological capability to provide. Well, I mean, as, in a sense, the in a sense the. Yeah, and and that's yeah, and that's and one and one of the one of the interesting things that sort of like you know caught me off guard a little bit, sort of um, made me think, oh yeah, I, you know, I didn't think of that, is when Jacques Fresco once said that we could use the polar regions as basic geographical fridges that we can store food food produce in the polar regions to keep it cold. That, instead of instead of like you know packing fridges, use the um, for for any surplus that can can be frozen. It's certainly an interesting idea, isn't it? So. Before we get to this resource-based economy, yep. you know, because of the way the world's out at the moment, especially mm. for America, the way it wants to dominate everything, take resources from everywhere and the world. Mm. Now, if we're going to do that, then we're going to have to have Sure, that's just going to create conflict. You've already got like China buying up land in Africa. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you think there'll be a doomsday scenario before it all? There could, there could, <laughs> very, there could very I remember well a film be. when I was young. I don't know if you've ever seen it, Logan Trump. I've, you ever I've, seen it? I've been meaning to get round to watch it. I've been meaning to get round to watch that, but I, I hear that, that reference quite a bit. There, if we're not careful. So the Logan's run, the only, the only for example. The only way I possibly see it kicking off is, mm. unfortunately, like I've got kids I never wanted to happen. Mm. If something like that happened, and then you get 
community started again. That's happened to Greece, hasn't it, in countries like that, where, yeah. where the economy completely yeah. collapsed, you know, they don't even have the basic sort of health care sort of things. So yeah, but it's... That, that makes so it have to do that. That makes the importance of us educating as many people as we can, and yes. I mean even bigger because when the time comes and yeah. you know if there is a collapse and the people that are left or whatever you know they, they know that actually the way forward is a research-based economy, not, economy not start well. the same crap all over again. I must say it's um, I imagine it's quite difficult to imagine a resource-based economy without seeing everything that we currently have collapsing first. Yeah, and that's and, and that's really the thing. Yeah, it's. It's an unfortunate reality of um, of the human mind that you know we we're, we're taught to be comfortable right now. And we're taught to accept this as it is, and like this is the way it is. And because of that, unfortunately, we do have we you know in most situations you do have to suffer at least a little bit in order to to realise something and. Uh, you know, and as as I said in one of my podcast shows before, you know, we have to be shaken by the lapels hard enough to wake us up to the fact that we can't have infinite growth on a finite planet. And for a lot of people, it's going to have to take that at least at least a modicum of of suffering. Like like say for example, for me, uh, like one of the things that woke me up is um, is you know realizing that the 2006 recession hit and and I looked around and I saw um, suffering I I personally didn't suffer because back then I was living with my parents but um, but I recognized the suffering and I, and I thought right the system isn't working so and you know initially I had the I had the ideas of because um, I started researching loads of different alternative economic systems even even researched um, uh, anarcho primitivism and uh, anarcho cynicalism and um, and uh, even the economics of the Star Trek world and I had all these ideas of like collating all my research and uh, emailing Gordon Brown because Gordon Brown was the Prime Minister at the time like saying look here's my research what do you think about this so I think like we need to move in this direction because that's when the recession hit and I knew that things weren't working but the you know we it's hard for someone to actually make a realization with um, as dire as what we're facing without at least being smacked around a bit. You know, it's the um, the unfortunate reality. You know, we, you know, the uh, the people who advocate the psychos movement, like myself, we don't want the system to collapse. We don't want people to suffer, but we do recognize that for a lot of people. Suffering has to be the conduit through which that they actually wake up, and we're here to basically say, "Look, it's okay. D you know, we can do better as a, as a species. We can provide it. But we're it here have for that." To be personal <laughs> suffering. I mean, nobody no will get. There's like a uh, pyramid, if you like, that goes, you know, good decisions arrive from experience, which only arise from bad decisions. But the bad decisions don't have to be your own. It doesn't have to be your own experience. It could be somebody mm. else. I mean, for example, I woke up not because I woke up but was, became aware of this whole train of thought not because I've experienced any personal pain and just I've you know um, looked at other You've people that are experienced pain so uh, I think there needs to be suffering at some scale but it doesn't have to be as big as perhaps yeah exactly saying. and um, and that's <coughs> and that's the thing I mean uh, as as you said the you know the 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 doomsday scenario is possible if we don't do anything about it if we don't actually strive for this kind of this direction as quickly as possible because you know we're I mean the, in one of my podcasts I, I likened the, the the scenario that we're in at the moment to a, a runaway train and essentially you know the the uh, the coal in the in the train's furnace is like an old steam drain um, the coal in the furnace is basically our planetary resources being being consumed and in order for the it's not a runaway train by fault or by error it's a runaway train by design it's designed to need to keep going faster and faster and faster and burn more and more and more coal and as it as it goes faster and faster the linkages between the carriages are starting to get really strained 
and it's the it's the carriages right at the very back that are the weakest links. That being the poor, the people who have the less, the the less amount, and they and they you know they're already you know they're already falling um, falling out of the windows because they're they're panicking. You know the um, the the train's just going so fast it's knocking people knocking people back and forth. People you know. <laughs> People are exiting out of the train, not not through their own choice, but because the train cannot keep them on there. And eventually, in that kind of scenario, there's only two outcomes, really. They're either the train will run out of coal and just grind to a halt, or it will derail itself. So therefore, what scenario do we find? Well, in terms of the, uh, the Richard Buckminster Fuller um, example, build a new model which makes the existing model obsolete. We need a stable and steady parallel locomotive system for us all to move on to so that we can exit this infinite growth paradigm and go, right, slow it down. We need to find out what we got. We need to preserve it, you know, and protect it. I was going to say, apart from the actual business model, I think it'd be good to bring back the sense of community. I mean, Absolutely. Street, and turn up all their electrics. Immediately, they will come out of their little sort of bubbles and communicate with each other, and mm. they're all in the same boat again. Yeah. If they had no water, they'd all be helping now, you know, the elderly in the street all coming together again. So yeah, and that's, that's where it's going to the extreme of there's no communities mm. left anymore, especially in mm. like really busy cities. Yeah. yeah. But knowing that this is coming, you need those structures in place already, don't you? You need to, yeah. for people to know what to do people to know where to go, who to see and who to, you know, what they're barred or don't. Yeah. Mm. Well, that's why we've got to have all the places this is what it's going to work on. Yes, it's, it's not, we know the problem is there, we know what the problems are, we know what the solution mm. is. It's now time to put it into practice. Mm. Absolutely, and, uh, and going... But that means to start happening. Yeah, and, and going back to the... Um, to actually put it into place now, well, that's what I was saying about the small model. Yeah, and, and going going back to like the uh, the small self sufficient community um, ideas. That I mean that that sort of thing is wonderful, and it you know and it and it's brilliant when it when it does work. However, it can't exist in isolation. It has to, that that the system collapses. Yeah, everybody's going to rush off to there, and then that's going to exactly blow up exactly. It's another thing. Can I just thing, ask? I mean, yeah. for for everybody. I mean, from the point that you've all become aware of the the strain of thought that. How did you find, or what did you find the most useful when trying to communicate the ideas to other people? Because it's something that there's a main reason I came today to find out what has worked for you guys when talking to other people. What do you think people are more receptive to, or more what they're not? You know, because obviously we come across a good question. similar good question. objections. But what do you find most useful? Well, I find for me personally, everyone sort of shouts me down. They say to me, we can't live in a resource based economy, we've got to live with money. I think you have to, you have to teach it, it, people in a very gradual yeah, way. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I don't know everything, but I try to get my point of course as, as best as I can. But everyone shouts me down and says, we, we need money to, to carry on, we need to live in a money. And what do you respond to that? Well, I just try and inform them the best I can. I don't try and push my idea, I don't try and get aggressive. What's with the first thing that you talk to them about though? It, it, like, what, Basically, I try to, to get across the point that money is, is to lead to corruption. No, money leads to corruption. No, no matter what the way you look at it, there's always corrupt things about it. So to get beyond that, you've got to remove money. Also, you're doing something whether it's intrinsic, because basically, if you get an artist to draw and they can do it freely, whatever they want to do, but as soon as the money comes into it, it becomes then they have to do it. Yeah, and but to say to me that we need to live with money is, is insanity to me. I don't believe that. One of the well, one of the brilliant things that I learned from uh, from Jim Phillips, and it's, it's one of the things that I'm trying to to put into my communications as much as as much as I can, as you know, contrary it is to my previous communications. But he taught me that you know, whenever someone tells something to you, even if you disagree with it, start off by agreeing with them, saying, "Yeah, you're right," because for one thing, it it partially disarms them, and also there's there's a, a thing in uh, in neuroscience uh, called the uh, the cortisol response. But basically, if you're um, if you're interacting with someone and you're trying to oppose their position, 
then they they will react in a negative way and they will put down they will put down the shutters or put up so a wall. So the defense mechanism that gets yeah. defensive. It's very easy. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of using the word but, so yeah. instead of saying I know what you mean but, you just say I know what you mean and also yeah. so use Basically, the word, oh, use the word and, and but also yeah. use the word and instead of but and then you don't get a wall. Yeah. Yeah, or I know how you'd feel, yeah. I would feel the same or I'd feel the this, same. Listen, I've, I've, I've been laughed at from my ideas, I've literally been laughed at, you know, I'm like no, no, but you, yeah. there are certain ways, I know it's yeah. kind of manipulating the mind, but there are certain, unfortunately being in sales, or I have to learn these things, but there are certain words that you... NLP, yes. NLP, I had a person, I work with people, buyer of people, and um, a salesman came in to give us an NLP approach to dealing with conflict. Sure. And it was not possible, is it? The way you speak, your Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a whole site. It's very useful. You, See, you my, my problem is people, people confuse um, people confuse my, my passion for aggression. I get quite, you know, I'm not being aggressive. It's my passion. Mm. But people mistake yeah. for aggression. It's, it's, it's very, it's very easy to confuse those two because yeah. there's, a very, it's not, it's not, there's not, a very thin, blurred line it's, between. It's so, a thin line. Yeah, and it's, no, I'm, and it's, I'm not being aggressive. It's my, you know, I'm being what passionate. Yeah. What I, it's energetic, but I'm not, mm. you know, I'm not forcing. Mm. Just, you know, exactly. it's my, for what I believe in. Yeah. I'm passionate. Yeah. And the well, thing, and the thing is, is about people think I'm going for a midlife crisis. <laughs> <laughs> what I found really useful um, is two per, uh, two personal experiences that I had, and they're all related to money. Um, and one of them I was telling you on the way, I have a friend that lives in Singapore and he's got two properties um, in Woolwich and Clare Work and I didn't help him out and collect the rent for him once a month from the tenants. And when I went to Santander to deposit the rent, I was standing in the queue and as you know in Santander they will discuss your own private financial matters for everybody to hear because they do it on the, on the net. So I was, you know, overheard, I didn't mean to but it was very loud and obvious to everybody in the queue that she was speaking and the lady at the, till, uh, at the desk was speaking to a guy that um, went over to ask five pounds and then she was explaining, look, that's what we charge you, 25 pounds. And that's why, you know, when you didn't pay that, we had to charge you again. And the guy was going mad. He was, he didn't speak very good English, but she sent him away to the telephone banking. And I came to the, it was my turn and I, I came smiling and she asked me why, you know, are you okay? I said, well, it seems a bit stupid, don't you think that, you know, if you don't have money, then that's, that's you take what you don't have. That's why the guy's angry in the first place. Sure. <laughs> but, but then if you, but I find that when I tell people a story like that, of a personal experience, of, and actually yeah, I can relate to that, rather than saying in general, money is all evil, or if I described to them, I had another conversation with a banker discussing a potential loan that I wanted to take, and I just asked him, so let's say you were to give me 10 grand, but do you have? Where does that money come from? And he explained to me, well, you know, we have a lending budget, just like a marketing budget and everything else. I said, okay, so if you take, if you give me 10 grand, you take it, 10 grand out of HSBC Maidstone account and move it into mine? He said, well, kind of. I said, out well, of their reserves. I said, well, you know, our, our lending budget is other people's money, i.e. Uh, current accounts, saving accounts. I said, okay, but you wouldn't take 10 grand out of Adam's account and move it into mine, would you? Physically or electronically? He said, well, no. I said, so, what you're really saying um, is that you're creating money out of thin air, aren't exactly. you? Exactly. He said, yeah. So when again, when I explained yeah. that to people, you got the whole, you know. Um, so that was a, that was a clock that revealed, revealed that to you. Sorry. Was that a clock that revealed? No, no. That the, to well, the discussion about the fractional reserve, yeah, about the loan, that was an actual. Um, Bank, banking advisor or whatever. Oh right. No, no. The, the I, I normally I normally ask the clerks like if they're a, a final thing I say oh just well just one more thing just a curious question what exactly is backing this note <laughs> and they're like well, I don't know yeah, it was a proper enough you know, sitting down discussion checking my details and my you know we didn't yeah. do a full credit check but it was just kind of you know it, what would be the rates kind of thing if I wanted to take a loan so mm. yeah I so like if we had regular meetings instead we have to convince people maybe. Well, I mean, uh, one of one of the one of the people that I we can we yeah. can maybe decide to have like a topic every time because we can go on yeah. a million different things. If we decide one week mm. discuss um, you, you know money, the other um, the other week without invading too many other subjects because money obviously is a very wide thing but yeah. you know perhaps um, you know like you have technological unemployment where every time we can mm. choose a subject and then invite people along 
Yeah. It's, not, it's not about convincing, it's about informing. Yeah, just so don't, don't try and convince, just inform. Yeah. Yeah. And let them make their own mind up, you know? Because yeah, the because the person themselves yeah. is, is the, the person convinces themselves. Let them make their own mind. Up. Don't try and yeah, yeah this is it. No. Would I also yeah. find it is anybody that I ever I introduce them to the zeitgeist? I never ask them to watch zeitgeist the film, the movie, the first one first. I always say no. watch addendum, and then moving forward. Is that the last one? Yeah, no, addendum um, is the second one. Second one. Yeah. and then go into moving forward because I find the first one containing a lot of material on, on religion yes. and 9-11 that can really put a big wall in people's yeah. mind when they've never been exposed and plus, to these kind of plus things. Plus it's got nothing nothing to do with a resource based economy anyway. I no, mean uh, there, there was one point in history I think when uh, when Peter Joseph was going to re-edit uh, Zeitgeist the movie to put a more sort of like resource based economy bent on it but then he thought no this, I created that way before I found out about any of this yeah, stuff. No point. That, Venus Project, yeah. yeah, I mean that that film stands alone. It wasn't even originally a film, so. So I would yeah. recommend I think if you the first do. one opens your eyes up to what, yeah. what is actually going on behind the scenes. It introduces you to a train of thought to to really sort of like dig deep because I mean I um, as I said to you uh, earlier this evening I used to watch a lot of documentaries about conspiracy theories. None of them sort of like bit as hard as Zeitgeist did none of them none of them did I mean even some of the things I saw in Zeitgeist I was like really? have you seen the uh, the, the Five movie it's, it's, it's a movie called Five. Oh, Five right. yes Five, yeah, yeah right. very yeah. very good I mean I missed that point it started great mm. but then it just wanted to put a fair economic yeah. system like yeah. you missed the whole I point I find that that movie explained it better than Zeitgeist it did in a way for me it but did but mm. the solution is not yeah. 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 Well, he's but doing it, sociology that opened my eyes and realising all about on paper, you know, about Marxism and that kind of thing. That was the start of my, well, yeah, a couple of sort of that I was in on to get it going. But yeah, I think, um, I don't know, just the regular meetings, I think it'd be a good idea, honestly. Mm. Like, but but, it's, but stuff before stuff. that bit, what do you think would be best well, before you manage to convince somebody to come to a meeting? So obviously today's an example oh, that we found it very difficult. Mean. Remember, you haven't convinced yeah. them that no. they're going at their own free will, you see, that they, you've, told, you've, you've told them something. Sure. And they're like, yeah, well, I, I, I believe them, saying I agree, no, I'm going to come. You're not convincing no one. I think, I think uh, you know? sometimes you do have to kind of manipulate people. No, I don't know, you haven't got to manipulate, no. You, you give them the information, let them take it on. And if they think in the same manner, they will come naturally. You haven't got to convince no one. Do you know what, so a lot of people do agree that I've spoken to, but like you were saying about the utopia thing, oh yeah, that would be ideal, but that will never happen. And having to get past that first bit, hmm. that's what to say. Do you think it'll happen in our lifetime? I think it's possibly unlikely to happen in our lifetimes. However, that's no reason not to do it. Because the, I mean, you know, the there seems to be a, a bit of a uh, a pride thing in uh, in a lot of uh, people's beliefs when they when they talk about a. Uh, like a, a distant event, like say for example with religious people saying that when, when Jesus is going to come back, the vast majority of people who say that Jesus will come back, they say that Jesus will come back in their lifetime. So there's the ego attached there. But, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's, very, it's very hard to tell, but even if it doesn't happen in my lifetime, I will still strive for it because I can't see any higher... Um, any higher pursuit than making things better for future generations, regardless if, if of like whether I now, personally it, it benefit. It will never happen. Yeah. If you don't think like it now, it will never happen at all. Well, so, well yeah, if exactly. If we don't think about it now, obviously it would never happen. Well, yeah, and, so, uh, you know, that's... It will just be green and green yeah. and then everything and nuclear war... So you've got, you've got to start somewhere <laughs> to, make, to get to that point. Well, we yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I say to it, to anyone who says, oh, oh it will never happen. I say to them, well, I'll tell you what, the reason why you're in such a bad state of affairs right now and everyone, all of the rest of us are in such a bad state of affairs is because every single generation before you has said the exact same thing. And think about this, if, uh, like, you know, echoing back to a pop, um, the previous thing in my uh, presentation, if every single person who really, really made a wonderful innovation and a wonderful invention, a wonderful change in human consciousness, if they'd listened to all the people that were telling them, it'll never happen, you know, 
It's, all, it's always been there, but it's all been suppressed. Yeah. It's always been there, but it's always yeah. been suppressed. Because the thing is, the, re the reason why we're in uh, the state, um, the you know, the advanced state of technology, and the uh, and even the fact that we are all sat here right now, is because we have ignored the the niggling cultural voice saying it will never happen. We've ignored that because if everyone listened to that, where would we be? We would be nowhere. Do you believe in um, the Illuminati? New World Order? Um, um, elite, elite group in the world, do you believe in that? I, be I, be I know, I, well, I know for a fact that there are certain groups of very wealthy and, and, and the very... Of it doesn't really yeah, matter who it exists or not. Well, the, well, the, the, well, the, the thing is, it's... Can I just say something? Can I just say something? If you want to... If you're interested in the Illuminati, right? I mean, I was just looking through stuff on the web, but the reason I found Zeitgeist was because the Illuminati. The Illuminati. Yeah. But it was a website called the Armageddon Conspiracy. Right. And according to these guys that on this website, they are the New World Order. The Rothschilds, etc., have made out that they're the bad guys, and it's all been twisted now the other way. That they, they are the evil. No, the Illuminati are the good guys. Yeah, the Illuminati, yeah. yeah. But the, no, the, both the Rothschilds have made evil. out the Illuminati are the bad guys, but it's all twisted around. But there, there are an elite few. If you're charge interested, the, the if you're interested, if you read the Armageddon conspiracy side, they can try the mask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's yeah, about I mean, three million. There's about three million. Something. Somebody written this stuff. There's about three million words on this side. It takes a hell of a lot of reading. Uh, I mean, I essentially, believe, essentially, I, I at the, uh, uh, essentially at the at the end of it, I mean, even even if even if this there there existed a a sect of reptilian shape shifting lizard aliens that wanted to depopulate the world by spraying us with aluminium, and even if even even if yeah, even if David Icke's uh, wet dream was actually a reality. All it is is a visual interpretation of mm. the left hand side of the brain. That's well, all it is. even if all of that, even if the worst case scenario was a reality, what does that change about what we need to do to create a better world? It changes nothing. So it doesn't matter whether they exist or not. But I think the Times now, what we call the Occupy movement, and all you know, against the control now, because everything's firing out of control, everyone losing their homes, their jobs, and everything else. Mm. So I think now is the time to push the new ideas forward. The question is, yeah. what do we do? I mean, because uh, I think we all have a responsibility to, you know, on a personal I level. I see what you mean, yeah, to talk, spread the word. Yeah, to talk mm. to as many people as, as we can. And uh, the reason I asked the question before, what do you find useful, is because. We need, it f obviously everybody's different, but I think there, there should be certain basic things that work better than others. For example, touching on um, you know, the subject of money, you know, and how money, what money is, because everybody I speak to doesn't have a clue, like I didn't have a clue before this. Maybe um, we should do that next time, like all think of ideas of how we can... Like, yeah, so, so I guess, like so I guess one... So I guess one one good thing we could all do um, whenever whenever we have a, a spare moment, think think on think on that question. What did we find useful about? Is it the the train of thought or the? Well, no, about about approaching other people. What do we find that works? Yeah. When talking and ah, talking right, to yeah. about the, the concept. Yeah. So maybe if if we all um, in our own in our own own time, just have a think about what works for us. I think, you know, for example, you do hagophoning. <laughs> yeah. Adam, yeah. for example, you do hagophoning. Um, you, you can probably agree that it's not for everybody to do that. No, not for everybody. Um, and I'm sure there is a lot of people that would, you know, like that and a lot of people that would really, yeah, mm. that people would, and, and if they would associate, if everybody tried to do that and everybody would associate our type of information to that behavior or that action, mm. then they could create a you know a negative wall as well. So we need to, to see what different also, ways they're more. proud. If they, I've worked hard for 30 years, they don't want you to come along and say, well, you know, you're just yeah. saying anything. Yeah. 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 yeah, sorry, you say the same thing. You know, during the transition, um, essentially, well, 
Yeah. Yeah. Even well, the, still going to be some kind of well, well the, the thing is, I mean, uh, we we need to recognise that um, the more we implement aut um, automation in, the more we can actually make things uh, more efficient and more productive. So. It, it makes logical sense to do that. It doesn't make market sense to do it. It doesn't make monetary sense to do that because, you know, it's like, you know, you, um, otherwise, uh, you know, the, that might actually possibly breed this twisted thing of saying, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll create sentient robots who know the concept of money and get them to distribute money just so we can save the monetary system. No. I don't mean when, like, you know, when we got to the state where most people but that can now be a problem. Mm. But during the transition stage, there's going to be yeah. some kind of manual labor. Yeah. Well, the. Yeah. You're doing some people would, but a lot of people would do some sort of thing. In the monetary system, you need the amount of volunteer. It's way beyond what you need. Yeah. Like, like, say, like, like, like one of the things, like, I mean, one of the perfect examples of that is that. Uh, Every now and then, um, I actually mostly ask this to uh, to people working on a on a till in a supermarket. But uh, if the if the sh if there's enough shopping to sort of like create that sort of situation where generally there's an uncomfortable silence, I sort of I generally fill that with a couple of curious questions. And one of them is I, I ask them, if you didn't have to worry about money, would you do this job for free? And uh, the vast majority of them say no. And then, yeah. And um, and then and then I'd say, okay, well, in that case, what would you devote your your life energies to? And the vast majority of them would say something like, I'd you know, I'd travel to travel the world, like teaching kids Spanish, or uh, they they'd say they'd say something compassionate and meaningful. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant video. Yeah. 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 Y
in a resource-based economy, for example, people aren't necessarily going to want... Yeah, exactly. People aren't necessarily going to want to stay in the same area because they can wake up one day and say, do you know what? I want to go to Australia. So they go to Australia. Yeah? yeah but so that's once we get there, it? Yes, yeah, but... Can, can but I say just something yeah. during the transition? What, what I was mm. thinking is something that can help. I, I thought about something... Um, I just named it the, the free revolution, meaning... Um, everything that we do in society today, if I, for example, in my day job, provide a service that I decided one day to say to one client, actually, you can have the service for free, yeah. Yeah, although it costs me, let's say, money or whatever, I'll give that for free. All I ask for you is to continue the chain. So whatever you serve, uh, give them, okay. give them, you know, we'll just choose one person, yeah, yeah. one field, just do the same thing with the same condition. And I think if we start that at one level and then continue it to more levels of operation, eventually when we get to the transition, we won't really, we, I, would, you know, I would like to think that we won't have too much of monetary exchange. I think it's fine. You know, like no one's coming up to kick really us out. Half of the work goes straight away, easily. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, that's that's one of the. Um, I mean, one of the uh, transitional steps that even yeah. Peter Joseph has alluded to is that. Yeah, I mean, you'd um, you'd basically bring in automation, and you'd, uh, as as people would say, you would halve the work week. You would free um, free people up. You would um, you know provide. Uh, Put the systems in place where their needs can uh, can be met, like for example with food with food needs, and um, and you'd uh, let them, you know, basically interact with uh, with the system to basically tell the system what sort of what sort of things you need, and um, and that and those sort of things can be uh, can be provided. I mean, it's you know, I'm I'm not worried whatsoever about the technological side. The the the, the the technical side, it's it's done. We, all, we we just have to join together loads of disjointed systems. We just have to unify them, and then it it's just wow. It, it could be awesome what we could do. The problem is our value side. That's that's the hurdle. Yeah, in a yeah in a set. I mean, as a society, we have a. In, in a sense, yeah, a, le a learning disability. Oh, in a sense, it's because it's I don't know if it's a bit like. Um, well, it's a bit like. Um, it's going to kill them off. It's going to bring it to a head anyway, so. Well, yeah, I, I mean. Um, I think we well, the, the, the reason is that uh, technology. Uh, I mean, we, we, uh, we recognise that technology can make things more efficient, but we try to resist the fact that the more we automate, the more we erode the cohesion of the monetary market system because it's based on human labor not machine labor so it's it, it's kind of like um, it's, uh, it's kind of like the um, if you were to uh, I don't know have a have a tube and uh, and that tube contains a certain series of balls, and uh, some of them, um, say for example, you have like uh, plastic uh, hollow plastic balls in the tube, and then you start pushing in lead balls into the tube. It starts forcing all the plastic ones out the other side. So therefore, in order to the the cohesion, let's just say for example, the cohesion of this tube is dependent on just having the plastic balls in the tube. And that is how the equilibrium of this environment, say for example, is maintained. But you realise that um, that having the lead balls in there is much better because it's more sturdy. You know, it can't be crushed, for example. 
So, but the more you push in the lead balls, the more the plastic balls are pushed out. So it's like you know, we're, we're trying to have our cake and eat it. That's essentially what we're doing. What we're doing. We're realizing that technology is much better, but we're realizing oh, we're actually making it worse for us in a. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, because uh, because that's the thing. Technology is faster. Technology is safer. Technology is more productive. It's more efficient. It creates it creates more product. It creates more profit in the short term, and it's cheaper as well. It's far cheaper to automate. So there's that there's that sort of like you know. Uh, that, I mean, that's why, you know, it's called the contradiction of capitalism, because while it's a natural progression in of itself, it erodes the system itself. It's, it's, like, um, it's like, like a child outgrowing their clothes. You know, it's, it's, a nat- it's a natural growth, but, you know, it's like, you know, we think to ourselves, um, but then we have this value that, oh, no, I like, I like the, you know, like, because surely, uh, you know, you know, children that have, like, an attachment to a single item of clothing, they love this item of clothing, they never take it off. And then when they start growing out of it, they, they fight against it because they're like, no, I like this T-shirt, I don't want to grow it. But they have to grow out of it. So... Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what, guys. Um, since we're we're starting to discuss among ourselves now, so um, is there, guys? Is there, if we, guys. If we um, if we want to discuss, that's that's brilliant. Um, so shall we? Shall we? Um, no, no, no. I'm I'm just saying, like you know, if uh, shall we um, go into discussion now? And uh, is is that all the questions asked? Or um, yeah, I think maybe we should meet up next time, like you were saying, to to find out. Yeah. Because yeah. it's because it's a bit because it's a bit strange because like the camera the camera's just on me and like. Because, because it, it, you know, it's it's a bit like yeah, the fact. Hmm. Yes. But it, but it's. But it's just. But it's just. Um, but then again, I've I've got the I've got the audio I've got the audio recorder here, so I've got the audio recording here. So, I mean, like, say for example, when you were talking, my my recorder may not be able to pick up your voice, maybe as well as the camcorder will, because. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's it's just the it's just the, the I mean one of the main reasons why I had it pointed at me is because you know I I don't know whether any whether any of you are a bit have have any scruples about being filmed. So yeah. So so it's a good idea in that case. Yeah. So you know that and you know if the if the camera's pointed at me then you know it's obviously makes. makes sense. Um, well, this is the first of uh, first of its kind, um, but I hope that uh, that from now we'll actually have far more uh, frequent uh, meetings. But uh, but using the Z Day um, Z Day. Uh, so before thing. you just the Facebook page, how was it? Um, well, I created the Facebook page a few months ago because I basically moved uh, moved here from from West Sussex. And, and thought to myself, right, well, there isn't a chapter in Maidstone. Maidstone is sort of like more or less central to Kent because there isn't any other there, there isn't any other chapters in Kent. The 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 I got to it through the the TDM where there's like a website thing. I find a local chapter in yeah. this London. So it's the main like on um, Facebook, but then. Um, it's also yeah, on the main yeah, it's like yeah, it quite mm. to this one as well. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's the thing. I mean, that's that's why I created the Maidstone sort of thing because it because it's like well, since it's sort of like central to Kent, maybe it will like you know bring more people from like surrounding areas, and maybe even inspire the creation of other chapters. Like like for example, um, a uh, uh, 
a few weeks ago, uh, myself and uh, Jim Phillips, he's from the Watford chapter, uh, we both uh, decided to uh, to basically jump in his car. He's got this. Um, uh, if if you've seen any of uh, like the the stuff that Jim's done, he's he's got a twenty five slide um, exhibition sort of thing. You know, um, it's sort of like those um, those um, those sheets with uh, with like in, like presentation slides with that basically like sort of like eight feet tall. He's got like a twenty five. Uh, 25 frame uh, sustainability exhibition for the Venus project and uh, both me and him decided to uh, to go down to Eastbourne because um, he has a friend in, in Eastbourne, Michael, um, who was who's hoping to create an Eastbourne chapter and basically we just, um, we, me and Jim decided to basically go down there, give a couple of presentations, give the ex um, take people around the exhibition and through those talks and talking to people, they've now created a chapter in Eastbourne. So, and that's uh, and that's one. When you say talking to people, is it just random people in the streets? You just positioned that um, anywhere? And... Some some of them were random people in the streets because uh, basically uh, there was it was basically over a course of two days, a Friday and a Saturday. The Friday, um, I gave a talk, a slightly modified version of my first presentation transitional thinking and Jim gave a I think it's a one hour 20 minute presentation that was originally supposed to be half an hour but it extended to 100 uh, to an hour and 20 minutes but uh, but the following day we uh, we basically sorted out the exhibition and uh, just to ramp up some last minute um, promotion for it I thought uh, I thought to myself damn I haven't brought my free hug sign Screw it! I'll just make one, and uh, and me and uh, me and Michael just basically went out onto the streets of Eastbourne giving out hugs, and uh, and when uh, when people came out, oh, why are you doing this sort of thing? And it was like, oh, are you interested in uh, technology and sustainability? Oh, there's a free exhibition going on, and you know we sort of introduced. Have you ever tried using that. the questionnaire that they used in uh, I've seen it in Vancouver? Um, that you can download free. Download I haven't used a questionnaire yet. No, there's four I'll questions. To... I forgot what they were, but they're really, really basic things that you ask people. And I think I was right. thinking of a way to attract people to come to you because obviously there's loads of people on the high street trying to sign you up to charities and that. I mm. think if we could get, I don't know if it's legally allowed, but like a little sign that says four questions you will never have, a, you you won't know how to answer. So to right. kind of say that, people, think, well, I bet I can. So. I'd say, I wouldn't say that's illegal. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I mean, that's that that could be like one of the one of the things that you know we could we could arrange to do for for some street activism. You know, just even if it even I'm if happy it's to just. Pay for the um, whoever, well, you should. Uses it and, well, you know, I mean, you shouldn't have to spend a huge amount of money. You could you could just get a big sheet of cardboard. You know, permanent marker. Are we allowed you know, to find to it like a little base in a sign that comes from it? Are we allowed to use that in a high street? Um, no from the council, you should know. You have to get permission from the council to put something on the ground. That's why people yeah. stand with a subway sign holding it. Because they can't just think yeah. what's Oh, yeah, because I think there's a... Um, there's an, an insurance issue or say a public liability that insurance that issue. The ground and somebody just stands with it. You can stand next to it with a questionnaire as well, say four questions you can't answer, or mm. it's it's you can't answer these four questions. People think, you know, I'm outside number seven, and they're avoiding people on the street. I think it'd be nice to have like a big community event, like a big picnic where everyone brings something out, and they can just chat generally and ask questions. Yeah. And maybe invite something else later on. Yeah. I think maybe it could do with a new approach. Yeah. Because somebody, say, like a busy mum's not or father at work all the time. Mm. Mm. They're not going to want to sit all day maybe in talks, but they might come along to a picnic if they've got a couple of questions sure. why they think it won't work, and they might want. To yeah, and that I mean that's that's one of the. That's one of the things I did uh, a few years ago. Uh, both me and a, and a friend who who used to live in Maidstone, but he doesn't live in Maidstone anymore. Uh, we used to have a, a table with a. Uh, uh, I mean, we made our own Zeitgeist Movement banner, and uh, basically plastered that along the front of the table. And we had like loads of leaflets and DVDs, and we basically just stand there. And like basically give people uh, leaflets and DVDs and talk to people about it. And this was in like Moat Park. And um, we actually arranged. There, were, there was one time where we had a, a, I think a little, 
a little picnic sort of like get together thing where we um, where like a group of my friends who I you know think are sort of you know forward thinking I invited them to to come and like you know just sit and like have a chat about this sort of thing I think we you know it's Park can be a good place to start because people are more relaxed, they're not under rush, and not. Yeah. Are we allowed to them? Yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, the. I mean, we. Uh, me and my friend Michael did it for a few months, uh, like every every Saturday afternoon, and you know, no one came up to us and said, "Oh no, you can't do this." I think what's you important know. though, if we do do something like that, is to have ideally four people for the simple reason of people would normally be attracted to a stand or any kind of location if mm. there's a mass so even if it's four of us pretending to be you know people that are answering the questionnaire people would naturally come along with the yeah like, well, no, no, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's um, you know the curiosity attracts people I find that in any yeah I I, that normally people you yeah. know, if, if there's a mass a group of people somewhere yeah. yeah I mean I was I was thinking about this earlier today when um, when thinking about the uh, the hugs I was getting that uh, I was thinking to myself you know I wouldn't be surprised if my hugs actually appear in like small tight groups where where they're like there's big spaces between them because uh, yeah sometimes uh, the I think the biggest group hug I've had is like 17 people and they and I think they actually I know that they were on their way back from a uh, from a um, a bowling game because they they'd gone along to AMF bowling and because uh, I, I knew that because I um, I'd looked up on their blog because uh, they because they wrote on their blog um, we also had a big group hug with a socialist guy and I'm just like <laughs> I'm not socialist <laughs> but yeah. I've, couldn't be bothered to correct it. So, so how but, could we, um, um, perhaps we should, um, I mean, I don't know if everybody um, feels uncomfortable or, um, you know, giving their private details, but maybe, maybe we should, you know, have uh, emails or phone numbers to kind of try to coordinate. Yeah, yeah just, like, just, the, e- like, just email emails or yeah, Facebook is good. Everybody here on the Facebook page? Yeah. 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 Okay, great. So that, that, that could be a good way to start. And then maybe um, if we say in about three weeks' time, I mean, should we try to arrange what... Uh, a Mo Park picnic, another discussion here. Could do, yeah. I mean, um, I think the well, like somewhere, yeah. somewhere in town on a uh, weekday when when yeah. quite quiet, you know. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like you know, this this room, for example, I didn't have to pay for this room. It was completely free, and uh, you know, and even though. Is that because you're regular? Hmm? No, no, no. This um, no. When I uh, when I came in uh, when I came into this pub to book it, it was the first time I'd actually set foot in this building, so I didn't need to be. A... Why are you giving it for free? I don't know. Probably because I let them know that I'm not a Satanist or. So we're gonna buy drinks as well. Um. Well, yeah, yeah. I said that uh, that you know it's it's also you know I'll I'll bring so some anyway, bring some business your way. But yeah, it's, it's like you know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, and, and and even though we've gone we've gone over our time by an hour and four minutes, and they're not coming up to kick us out, so you know, yeah, they sound like they're having a good time down there, so you know, but yeah, I mean, uh, arranging venues, yeah, and um, so yeah, so I think uh, like maybe arranging. Mm. Like yeah. So they could just come along and join yeah. in anyway, and then I'll ask a few questions or get yeah. a few DVDs. And, um, I think that would be good to do something like that. Three DVDs. I mean, to be honest, I've got loads of DVDs. I've got a pack of home now. Yeah. No, no. Empty loads ones. of DVDs there. Yeah. I've got empty <laughs> ones. <laughs> All right, yeah. I'm happy to give you if you want to burn them. Um, well, it's, it's all right. I mean, uh, I've, I've, yeah, yeah, I've, I've got plenty of DVD. I mean, like, if you've, if you've got loads, then you might as well. Well, using your Xbox thing, I have a present for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah,
Um, well, if I have a TV that's hooked up to an Xbox, I can create my slides as a video file and play them through that. As long as the TV's big enough, then I can just do that. And, you know, you can just have it as a pictures, can't you? Because it's the same as PlayStation on Xbox, where you can put photos and look at photos. Not as familiar with the with the recent. I mean, the the latest PlayStation I got is the PlayStation Two, so I'm not familiar with the the most advanced. Oh no, 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 the PSP. That was the most advanced one I got. But um, but no, I mean, I I think it's a good idea for us to um, to. I think I think the picnics will be for when the weather's uh, when the weather's better. Um, because even today I was. Yeah. Yeah. And that's and that's the thing. I mean, like like say for example the um, the uh, the Worthing group for for the Occupy movement. Their regular venue to hold meetings was uh, was in a the the function room of a hotel. And the, this hotel, they they were perfectly fine with letting them use the room as long as they bought some drinks and. And I, I don't see anything wrong with that arrangement. So I think, you know, arranging meetings here is a good idea. So, so um, any more questions or anything that, that we need to say? Yep. Okay, doke. Well, thanks for organizing Yeah, and, uh, and thank, thank you all for coming. And